There was a, I've probably shared this with you before, but I read a story once about a, a, a pastor at a church and uh, every Sunday before he preached, he'd kind of walk up um, towards the back and face the back of the stage and then he'd turn around and come down and preach. And one day his little boy said to him, Daddy, when you turn around and face the back, what are you doing? And he said to his son, he said, well, I'm praying, saying, uh, Lord Jesus, would you give me a good sermon to preach this morning? And the boy looked back at him and said, well, how come he doesn't? Um, <laughs> So having said that, I'm going to pray <laughs> this morning and I'm praying that the Lord would give us ears to hear and eyes to see this morning. So Father, I pray God right now, Holy Spirit, will you open us up to truth, open us up to your word. Holy Spirit, I pray, Father, each person here that has your spirit, that Lord, they would look at the word of God, and that Father, as we're talking about renewing our mind, that we would understand, Father, that uh, Lord, your word has been given to us and that that is the vehicle and the way by which we renew our thinking. Lord, we sang in that song that, Father, we surrender all. Well, God, your word covers all of life. And so I pray this morning, Father, would you open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what it is that you want to say in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Okay, let's dive into this this morning. Um, those of you that are uh, joining us for the first time, we have been in a bit of a series. I'm not going to go on about it. It's been going on for ever since February, first Sunday of February. We're still there. And we're looking at the issue of renewing our mind. We've covered a lot of ground. If you want to kind of catch up, you can go and look at our YouTube channel and jump on there and, and, and catch up. Um, I'm saying that to say this, that, that today is a, uh, a, a flow on from that. And I don't want anybody to take things out of context today. Today has a context, and that context is this topic we're talking about, and it's this continuation of what we're looking at, which is, what does the Word of God say? Firstly, we started about us. What does the Word of God say about God? And then it's been flowing into, what does the Word of God say about some issues that right now are quite cultural, quite touchy, quite sensitive? So um, I just want to say that uh, if you have questions about things I'm saying, would you do the right thing and contact me? Okay? If you don't like some of the stuff I'm saying, that's okay. I'm not trying to say you have to believe everything I say. What I am saying now is you need to believe what the Word of God teaches. And, and, and here's what I found with a lot of, lot of what's going on in the world right now, is that culture or the world can say, here's what we believe and here's why. At least they have an explanation and they can go point A, B, C. Unfortunately, often in the church we go, here's what we believe. And then when they say, right here, why do you believe it? Well, it just is. Well, we're in a time and a season now where we need to be better than that. Amen? That, that's a result of us just not wanting to get into the Word of God, just not wanting to look at the Bible, just not wanting to spend time in there and understand not just what we believe, but why do we believe it. And I think because we haven't been able to articulate why we believe certain things, we either stay out of certain conversations, we pull back, we silence, we don't speak, Meanwhile, culture continues to speak. It is not being silent, and it keeps spreading its narrative. And my, my concern with what's going on, and I've said this several times, is for those, all the young kids in this room, what is church going to be like when they grow up? What is their picture of God going to be if the church doesn't talk about who God is and only allows the world to interpret God and tell them this is who God is? And so we need to find our voice, but we need to find our voice with wisdom and understand why, okay? Now, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there, prefacing that. Uh, I, I'm actually standing here today with a certain degree of fear and trembling um, in sharing with you because I know we're touching, uh, we, we're standing on some ground and we're starting to move into some issues that people have all kinds of thoughts and stuff about. So I want to just humbly present to you this morning Here's some things that I believe the Word of God teaches about uh, the, uh, a particular topic that, that I want to talk about this morning. Um, I, I can speak in front of 20,000 people. It doesn't bother me the size of the crowd. But the thing that makes me the most nervous is when I perform a wedding. Okay? Now, the reason I get so nervous performing weddings is because it's such a special day, isn't it? And you want everything to go a certain way, and it's memorable. And, and you know, we all, you look back on your wedding day, and everybody has these, you know, you want these great memories and things of a wedding day. So when I do a wedding, I feel very, uh, I've got to get this right. I really want to make sure that I don't fumble my way and make this, oh, the, the, the reception was awesome, but that preacher, dude, that married us, dude, what was going on there, you know? And I've had the privilege of doing some amazing weddings. I've married family members and uh, people in our churches. Uh, I remember once I did a pirate wedding. 
at Byron Bay, a pirate wedding. Everyone dressed up as pirates. Uh, I was a part of that at Byron Bay one time. Uh, I remember uh, at, at, at another wedding, uh, Mick and Kathy, you were at that wedding where I actually got asked by the, the people who uh, I was marrying. They asked me, would I do a, a, an air guitar solo? in the middle of them signing the register. So I did, because I tell them, if it's not immoral or illegal, I'll do whatever you want. It's your day. And they said, right, when we're signing the registry, there's this song playing. When the, so when the guitar solo starts, I want you to jump in front of the table and just go ham on air guitar. And uh, so I did. I did. I got to play air guitar there, a very memorable um, event. I remember marrying a couple at Byron Bay on the beach once. And uh, what happened was the, the husband had the dog about a kilometre down the beach with a ring tied around his neck. And, and he went, <laughs> and the dog came running down the beach, you know. And I said to him afterwards, I said, what would you have done if the dog chased a seagull or went out in the water? And oh, I don't know if I thought about that one. But anyway, thankfully, the dog came all the way down and it was a beautiful wedding. And, and it was at that wedding that at the end of that, we went back to the uh, bowling club at, at Byron Bay. This is going back many, many years. We went to the bowling club, and while we were there, we were um, you know, having a reception and so on, and this couple came up to me. And they were a, a same-sex attracted couple. Two women came up to me. You know, I got into a conversation with them. They were very pleasant people, lovely people. And we got into conversation, and then at the end of it, just before, the, as they were starting to get ready for the toasts and we had to give our attention back, one of them said to me, you know what? If, if we can get married one day, we would love you to come and do our wedding. Now, this was back at a time where uh, you couldn't perform weddings like that. Same-sex uh, attracted, same-sex unions were not legal in Australia back at that time. Let me give you a little rundown on marriage. The Marriage Act of 1961 is the federal law which sets out marriage eligibility and the requirements for a marriage to be legally recognised in Australia. Now, prior to that, the states and the territories had their own systems of law. And the Marriage Act was drafted up. There was no perceived reason to define what marriage meant. In other words, marriage was between two people of the opposite sex. It wasn't questioned in culture back then. It wasn't a problem. Everybody just knew and assumed that's the way it was. So when the Marriage Act was drawn up, there was no need to put in a definition of what marriage actually meant because society was pretty much on the same page. In 2004... The federal government, under John Howard, amended the act to include the phrase, the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others, voluntarily entered into for life. Now, this was done in response to a growing debate within culture about same-sex marriage. It was starting to be talked about and starting to become an issue. Between 2004 and 2016, there were over 20 what they call marriage equality bills that were tabled to Parliament, and every single one of them were defeated. However, on the 9th of December 2017, that all changed. Australia voted yes to same-sex marriage, and the Marriage Act of 1961 was amended to include same-sex couples. 61.6% .6 of the country voted yes, 38.4% of the country voted no. But only 79.5% of eligible voters actually voted in that in the first place. So, according to federal law, marriage as recognised in Australia is the union of two people whether the same sex or different, to the exclusion of all others, voluntarily entered into for life. This is a fact according to Australian law right now. However, if that couple were to approach me today and ask me to perform their marriage, I would still be unable to say yes. And I'd be unable to say yes for the same reasons that way back then I was unable to say yes. And it had nothing to do with the law. I want to have a little bit of a look at marriage this morning. I think this issue of the definition of marriage plays into a whole lot of areas that we're dealing with in culture right now. There are so many things that have splintered off as a result of this. And if we can understand, and I'm going to humbly present to you this morning, here's what I believe the Word of God tells us. Here's what I believe the Bible teaches us about that. Marriage is recognized in the sight of this nation between two people of the same sex. But the question for Jesus' followers is whether this view of marriage is recognised in the sight of God. Now, let me also separate the fact that those of us that are in Christ, those of us that are in Christ, the law of God, the Bible speaks to us. And it's easy for us to point our finger out there at the rest of the world and say, you guys need to be living like this. But the letters in the New Testament were written to believers to churches. They weren't thrown out there to society, to people who are not in Christ yet. So when we think about 
some of this stuff we're going to talk about. Yes, it speaks to society, but the challenge is, first and foremost, it speaks to the church. And if we get our hearts right and we get our understandings right, until people are in Christ, there used to be a saying when I used to teach evangelism, people used to say that, that, that um, you, don't, you, you can't clean the fish until you catch it. Anyone ever heard that saying? Yeah, used to be talked about, you, you, you can't clean the fish until you catch it. And sometimes we're guilty as a church of wanting the world to be clean first. We, 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 it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's not repentance, then you'll experience the kindness of God. So I just throw that out there as a thought. It's very quiet here this morning. It's okay, I knew that it would be. I knew that it would be. To get started looking at this question, some people say that Jesus didn't have a lot to say about same-sex unions and so on. I actually believe that he did. And I want to go there. Matthew chapter 19, verse 1 to 6. Can we put that slide up there, please? Matthew chapter 19, verse 1 to 6. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, for this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God, everyone say God. God has joined together. Let no one separate. That word united, a man will leave his father and mother and be united, means to be glued together, to be fastened firmly together. And the word where it says there, therefore what God has joined, that word joined literally means yoked, fastened together to one yoke. So God yokes together the two people who have mutually chosen to fasten themselves together for life. That's what marriage is. That's the picture we're getting here. Therefore, marriage is not an institution of man. It's actually God who does the joining in response to our free will decision. Amen? God joins us in response to our free will decision. Now, Jesus quotes from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Way back in the beginning, in the creation narrative, the book of origins, Genesis 2, 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. The New Testament writers take that and link that to the concept and idea of marriage. So in their mind, in, 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 in the mind of the writers, in the mind of Jesus at this time, when these people come and start talking about marriage, Jesus goes straight back to the origins, the beginnings of mankind, and he links that passage to the meaning of marriage. He pulls that from the past into the present, quotes the Old Testament, and says, this is a picture of of marriage. Now it says there that some Pharisees came to test him. So what was the test? Let me give you a little bit of historical background. Here was the test. The test was this. What did Deuteronomy 24.1 mean? Deuteronomy 24.1 says this. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her from his house. Right? Now back in Jesus' day, this was a big debate. What was meant by the word displeased? Now, when it says these Pharisees came to test him, there were two main schools of thought. There were two rabbinical schools. Uh, one was the school of Shammai, and one was the school of a, a rabbi called Hillel. Now, just to give you a, a, a big picture very shortly, Rabbi Shammai taught in his school, only adultery is grounds for divorce. Now, by the way, I'm going to touch on a few words and phrases and things that we could, that are a whole totally other topic. So I want you to hear my heart. I'm not talking about all these other things, Right? I'm sticking to what we're talking about here, a biblical definition of marriage. So Rabbi Shammai says only adultery is grounds for divorce. Rabbi Hillel taught everybody in his school that the word indecent could refer to any reason. Anything from she has a temper. She was talking to a stranger in public. Even she burnt the toast at breakfast. So you see, they're saying, can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? So they've come to test him, which... What, what, what reason? What reason, you know? And so there's these trains of thought going on because even back in Jesus' day, they hadn't settled every issue. There were still debates and discussions about what things meant. It's interesting that Jesus never throws the Old Testament away. Jesus never said that the Old Testament is bad and done away with. When Jesus rubbed up against the Pharisees, he never dissed the Old Testament. What he pushed back on was their interpretations of the Old Testament. 
their interpretations of the Old Testament. Some people say the whole Old Testament is gone, it's all... No, it's not. It's not that black and white and that simplistic. Otherwise, if the Old Testament's gone and the law is gone, hey, we can commit adultery, we can murder, we can have other gods before him, like where, where's the line, you know? Or is it just the big ten? So here's a question. Did Jesus answer the question? Look at that. Go back, go back to the first one, the first one before that. Can you please? Now, does Jesus answer the question? And the answer is yes. Can a man divorce his wife for any reason? And he says, well, marriage is God's idea, not man's. And he's joined you together because that was what you wanted. Therefore, honor what God has done, and both parties should commit to working on the marriage. Now, I know that marriages don't always work out, and this is not a, a debate, or I'm not trying to talk about marriages and so on. Um, I, I believe that there's great grace. I don't believe that... Uh, uh, there's only one reason why marriage breaks down. Uh, marriage is a complex thing, and there's complex answers in the Word of God about that. I want you to park that. I'm not talking about that, okay? But did Jesus answer the question? Yes, he did. Now, I've got a confession to make to you. I didn't give you the whole verse. I didn't give you the whole verse. Can we put the whole verse up now, please? The second one. I've capitalized what I left out last time. And here's what it actually says. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee, went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, and this is what I left out, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father, mother be united to his wife. Why did Jesus feel the need to add verse 4 when verse 5 already answered the question? Why put that in there? It's almost irrelevant and unnecessary. But he adds that in, again, going back to Genesis, drawing from Genesis, from the very origins, this picture of marriage. And he says, God made them male and female. And he goes right back to the beginning and he joins that up and he links that to the question of marriage. See, the question was about marriage and God's original design for marriage was for it to be a union of two people of the opposite sex. Not two people of the same sex. Sex difference in marriage matters. It matters. Why does it matter? I'm going to, in the time we got left, I'm going to try my best to explain three reasons why I believe sex difference matters in marriage. Number one, because marriage is a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 32 shows us this. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as, now he changes tact and turns a corner. Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as, here we go, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. There's very little there about husband and wife and he draws out this big picture really of Christ and church, right? Big picture of Christ and church. In verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Interesting language, as their own bodies. We are the what? Body of the head, Christ. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we, husbands and wives, male and female, we are members of his body. For this reason, here he does again, he pulls this narrative in from the Old Testament. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. There's a picture in marriage. Marriage is a literal picture down here on earth of the relationship, when done well, of the relationship between Christ and the church. This is what Paul is getting at here. Marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship to the church, sacrificial love, Protection, provision, safety, and the church's relationship to Christ. Submission in all areas of life. 
So there's this picture in marriage that Paul says, when done well with a husband and a wife, is a picture of the bride and the bridegroom. There's an analogy and a picture of Christ and the church in that. But key to that is a male and a female. Two people of the opposite sex. Marriage between two people of the opposite sex, a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, is a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. Christ's sacrificial love, our response is submission in everything. This is why same-sex marriage is not simply an agree to disagree issue. Because marriage is meant to be a representation on earth of the relationship between Christ and the church. Number two, because marriage is God's ordained method of fulfilling the first command he ever gave to mankind. Genesis 1, 27 to 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. I was out in my yard yesterday doing a bit of gardening and cutting things down and I had a look around my yard. I got a lot of dirt in my backyard and I was trying to find if God was still making people out of dust. I, didn't, I couldn't find him anywhere out there moulding human beings out of dust anymore. He only did that apparently once. And then from that once moulding of a person out of dust, he then ripped the rib out and created woman. And from that point on, he said, guess what? Now that's part of your job. Multiply, fill the earth. For that to take place, there's got to be two sets of biology that come together. The body is made in such a way that 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 very command of God cannot be fulfilled in the context of same-sex unions. Fill the earth must have a sexual connotation to it because God's not down here making people out of clay anymore. Number three. And I could flesh some of these out a bit more, but for time, we'll go through them. And thirdly, because same-sex sexual relationships are condemned in the Bible. And the only accepted sexual relationship is that which takes place within the covenant of marriage. That's very, very clear and needs to be understood. The only appropriate sexual relationship in the Bible is between a husband and a wife in the covenant bounds of marriage. Any type of sexual activity outside of that is wrong. Any type of sexual activity outside of that is wrong. Young people, I know we don't want to hear that, and I know, you know, I've got, um, I, was, I was brought up in the era of try before you buy, is what my uncles and that used to say, you know. And uh, you know what? God never said that. God never said that. God never said that once. Leviticus 18.22 says, Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Leviticus 20 verse 13. If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They're to be put to death. Now, praise God, we don't put people to death anymore for that, all right? Their blood will be on their own heads. The New Testament writers use this word, porneia. It's where we get our word pornography or porn from. It's a Greek word, porneia, and it refers to many different types of sexual sin. It's translated in the New Testament in many different ways. Sexual immorality, adultery, fornication, um, sexual sin. Even some translations, they'll, they'll call the word, use the word unchastity. Unchastity. Now, here's the thing. It had many, many different translations, but when a Jewish person heard that word, they knew exactly where it came from. And it came from Leviticus 18. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying when he spoke of immorality. They knew exactly where to go. They had a reference point for what that word meant, and that was Leviticus chapter 18, which is known as the Pornea Code. Now, Leviticus 18 talks about all kinds of sexual activity and makes it very, very clear what is appropriate and what is not. And so when Jesus uses that word, well, you might think one thing right now, but you've got to go back to that day. What were they thinking back then? They knew exactly what that word meant, and their minds were drawn back to Leviticus 18. I'm not going to read it here. Get some time. Open up your Bible. Go and have a look at what Leviticus 18 talks about. It was called the Pornea Code. In fact, Scott McKnight, he's a New Testament scholar and early church historian, uh, he says this, Pornea has two basic meanings, sexual relations with a prostitute, and sexual immorality, which for a Jew refers to prohibited degrees of intercourse. When you double-click on the term porneia, it takes you to Leviticus 18. It takes you to Leviticus 18. They knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Same-sex sexual relationships were considered sin within the Jewish community of Jesus. 
during his time. And in fact, ancient writings 500 years before Jesus came and 500 years after Jesus died. It's very, very clear that any type of sex outside of marriage, in particular same-sex unions, were banned and considered sin. 500 years before Jesus, this is outside of the Bible, 500 years after Jesus, it was just a given. In 2004, John Howard, as we just talked about, changed the definition of marriage to say a union between um, two people of the opposite sex. Why did we not have to say that before that? Well, before that, everybody just knew. Culturally, we just knew this is what it meant. Well, it's the same thing here. People say Jesus didn't talk a lot about it. He didn't have to talk a lot about same-sex unions because everybody within the Jewish culture was on the same page. They were wrong. They were wrong. Now, this is not to say that all questions about sex and marriage were answered emphatically. There were still issues they were battling through. Could a man have sex with a female slave? That was a cultural question back in the day. They didn't have an answer. The Jews had an answer. Was it okay to intermarry? But when it came to same-sex sexual relationships, they were considered sinful to the Jewish people. They understood the law of God, the word of God. There was no room there for that. Jesus never challenged the Old Testament. He challenged people's interpretations of the Old Testament. That's three simple reasons that you can go away, you can look at those scriptures, you come to your own conclusion. But we've referenced and danced around the issue a little bit, I guess, over the years, but I just want to make it very, very clear that I, I love people that are same-sex attracted. There's a difference between being same-sex attracted and being in a same-sex sexual relationship. And we're going to talk about... These are some of the things I want to talk about in the weeks going ahead. There's a difference between having a desire and acting on a desire. Okay? There's a difference. And I think sometimes as a church, we sometimes forget that. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we've been very ungracious to people that don't think like us. Here's the thing about Jesus. People that were least like Jesus really liked Jesus. The people that were least like Jesus, they really liked Jesus. When Jesus had a prostitute come and cry and break a flask and wipe. He didn't feel the need to tell her and drill into her, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Was it wrong? Yes. Did Jesus believe her lifestyle was wrong? Yes. But was that the first thing that he felt when he saw this woman? When he called Matthew or Zacchaeus, the tax collector, does it tell us that the first thing he did is he sat down to Zacchaeus and said, I'm going to tell you why Everything you do is wrong. You're disgusting. You're a traitor to your own people. You're ripping people. It wasn't in the heart of Jesus to first go after the issues, but it was to first love the person. It was first to love the person. Loving the person doesn't mean that we're agreeing with everything. This, this was one of my struggles with my kids. I'm just going to be honest with you. When our kids grew up, one of the big battles I had with my children when they came into their teenage years and, and just as they turned 18 and started trying to do stupid things, what I would call stupid things. By the way, the same stupid things I did. So. I, I, I just figured having me and, and Jackie as mum and dad, we were so good that they wouldn't have to, but you know, apparently we weren't. They would come and they would tell us something dumb they had done. you know. And my first reaction was to go after them Oh, that, that, you shouldn't be doing that. That's silly. Because I was afraid that if I just loved them, they would see my love as acceptance of what they're doing. And I think that's the tension we feel. If we love people that are different to us, if we love people that think different to us, if we love people that don't believe what we believe yet, what is that going to say to them? Is that, is that, do we feel like we're giving them license to continue down that path? Well, let me tell you something. You're already doing it. Because you're loving other people in the church here, and none of us are perfect. You're expressing love to other people you're sitting in here. Some people in here tell lies. Some husbands here, you don't treat your wives the way that the Bible talks about it. I'm not judging, I'm just saying, because we're human, we fall short. Some wives, you're not treating your husbands the right way. Some kids, you're not respecting your parents. Some parents, you're not doing perfect by your kids. Some of you at work, you're not full of integrity and honor. Some of you, like, we're all a work in progress, all of us, aren't we? So we know how to do that within here, but, but we struggle to do it out there. 
And this is the tension that we straddle. We need to be radically obedient to Jesus. Radically obedient to Jesus. But we also need to have radical love for people that are different to us. And these are the issues. These are the things we've got to think about if we want to see a change in culture. It's no good just holding up Leviticus 18. I don't think Jesus would have run, held up placards. I think Jesus would have loved these people first. Because they're made in the image of God. Jesus died on the cross. That blood we talked about was shed for every person on this planet. Whether you're like me or you're different to me. A guy came to church here. I'll finish up with this. A guy came into church here about three, four weeks ago. And I don't think he's come back. And that's okay. At the end of the service, I went up and tried to chat with him. I got caught up with people. He was walking out the door. I went and grabbed him, pulled him back. And just said, hey, how you going? Had a bit of a chat. Asked him how he found the morning. And he made this reference to me. He said, oh, yeah, when I, it reminds me of when I was a kid. I used to go to Blah, and I'm not going to say the denomination or the group. But I know enough about the denomination or the group to know exactly what he was saying. Extremely, extremely legalistic. Extremely legalistic. Anyway, I said to him, oh. I said, mate, well, you've kind of walked in in the mid- midstream of something, you know. You kind of, if you put the whole picture together, you'll understand that that's, but anyway. But he walked away and hasn't come back, and that's okay. But it got me thinking. I had two thoughts that haven't been able to sort of leave my mind since then. Number one was we don't ever want to lose sight of grace. We don't ever want to lose sight of grace. It's available to everybody that's outside of Christ, and grace is the only reason those of us in Christ can still stand before God. It's grace first, grace in the middle, grace last, and we don't ever want to lose sight of grace. And sometimes we've been ungracious with people who are different to us. And think different to us. And act different to us. And live different to us. In fact, just in studying and, and, and researching and trying to get my head around some of these issues in a way that I can present them to a church, um, one of the things I discovered is that there are so many people that are uh, same-sex attracted, for example. This is a common story. I'm same-sex attracted. I couldn't talk about it with anybody in the church. And when I finally did go to my pastor and say, hey, I've got this struggle, they're either trying to cast a demon out of me or they're pointing, blaming my parents, or they're blaming, the, or it's just black and white, it's this or it's that. So then I stopped talking about it because I realised I can't talk about that kind of a struggle in the church. I mean, we could talk, we, we could talk about anything else, couldn't we? You know? I hope we can. But then what happened was I went outside the church and I found this community of people that I could talk to and they loved me. And they listened to me. And before you know it, they dive fully into that lifestyle and fully away from the church because the church is not a safe place to go. I was speaking on a, a training school, a YWAM school in New Zealand many, many years ago, long time back now. And a guy said to me at the end of lectures one day, he said, can I have a chat with you, please? I said, yeah. This is way back before this became an issue, <laughs> to the degree it is now. We went for a walk and he said this to me. He said, I am struggling with same-sex attraction. He said, I'm attracted to boys. But he said, I know it's wrong, and I'm never going to act on it. But the struggle is real. And we had a bit of a chat, but he said this to me. He said, I can't talk about it in there. When I first went to YWAM at 19 years of age, we had a guy in my training school. A wonderful, wonderful man. Married, happily married now, children, married to a woman. But he came out of a gay lifestyle, homosexual, same-sex attracted lifestyle. And he was sitting at a table... And here's what happened. I've got a mate of mine. He's an ochre Aussie guy, most beautiful guy, with no malice or no bad intent. But here's what he did. We sat around a table, and something came up, and this is way back in the early 90s. Something came up about homosexuality and so on. And he sat there and said, oh, I don't understand them fags. And made some derogatory comment like that. This was before any of us knew that this guy sitting there had just come out of this and was trying to navigate his way out of this and into discipleship went underground and never talked about it again until the end towards the end of his school now came out and began to speak about it now i'm saying all that to say this that we need to be a little more sensitive to some of this stuff with our throwaway lines with our black and white stances let me be clear is 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 what is marriage marriage in the eyes of god is a union entered into voluntarily by two people of the opposite sex i'll be very very clear on that that stance will never change same-sex sexual relationships are wrong. 
I won't change my stance on that unless you can convince me from the word of God. I will not change my stance on that. But that's the activity, the actions. But we need to learn how to love the people in spite of it. Because Jesus did it, and he's my model. He's my model. All kinds of sinners love to be in the presence of Jesus. I think too often today they don't like being in the presence of the church. We need to be careful that we don't allow our knowledge of God's grace toward us. This is the second thought that came into my mind. We need to be careful that we don't allow our knowledge of God's grace toward us as individuals to become a reason why we don't acknowledge, deal with and wrestle to the ground the sin that is still a very real problem in our own lives. I believe in grace. Yes, we are forgiven. But sin still exists. And as that gentleman walked out the door, I thought, wow, we don't talk a lot about sin directly here at Arise, but we're just t- touching on a few issues. And as soon as somebody walks into a church and hears somebody say there's such a thing as sin, they don't want to come back to church anymore. I'm not saying that's his motivation. I don't know. I don't know. So I'm not judging the guy. But I'm just saying, sin is real. There are things that are wrong. And it's okay to talk about them. In fact, this is the place to talk about them in church because we're all cross followers, amen? We all want to grow in our relationship with God. I want to know what the Bible says. I want to be a better disciple. I want to follow hard after God. And not only that, I want to have answers to people out there when they come and I've built relationship enough with them and they want to know, why do I believe what I believe? I want to be able to say, here's why I believe that. I love you as a person, but here's why I don't condone or agree with your lifestyle choice. Here's why. It's not me. Don't get mad at me. I follow God. I believe in God. And here's what I believe God has to say about these particular issues. Sin is real. And here's the, th- here's the, ch- the thought I want to leave you with today. Each one of us have our own stuff to deal with in our own life. It's amazing how gracious we can be with certain sins and ungracious we can be with others. Usually we're very gracious with the sins that we feel like we don't struggle with. Sorry, the other way around. We're very gracious on the sins we struggle with. Very ungracious on the things that we don't personally struggle with. It's very quiet in here again. Very quiet. Oh, well, if we haven't, can't, we're growing, so if we can't get a bigger building, I'll just have to cut the church in half by preaching like this. <laughs> I've got stuff in my life. I've got sin in my life. And I'm, I'll tell you what's going on in my personal world. The more I'm digging into some of this stuff and looking at this stuff, the more God is convicting me of stuff in my own world. Take the speck out of your own eye and then you'll feel right to judge. We're allowed to judge, by the way. New Testament says I can to judge. It just says there's a few steps that you need to go through personally before you have the right to do that. So I'm committed to trying to get the specs out of my own eye and I hope each of us are here this morning as well. Let's just stand. I want to pray for us. If you're visiting today, as I said, we're in a series here. This is, you've, you've stepped into a season and a space that we believe God's got us in, that, that, that God's calling us down. Um, it's not always this heavy. I often say that you know, some days you're throwing out Mars bars to people, some days you're throwing out kumquats and broccoli and or veggies that people don't like. You know? And that's what I'm doing at the moment. I know that. Uh, stick with us if you're visiting. Um, I'm going to pray for us. Then feel free. We've got tea and coffee out the side there. Go and grab a tea and coffee. Hang around, have a chat with somebody. Go up to somebody and say, that guy up there, is he always like that? And they'll say, no, no, he's actually a loving guy. He's a great guy. Hang around, get to know him. <laughs> he's a good fella, hopefully, hopefully. Otherwise, you walk out hand in hand together. So, Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word. I, God, I, God, your word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. God, James says the word of God is a mirror. And God, when I look in a mirror, the first thing I see is myself. I don't look into a mirror to see somebody else. I look into a mirror to see me. Father, I thank you that you have answers for us. God, I thank you that you, God, in your word, you have revealed things. And God, we are committed to living as followers of Jesus Christ. We are committed to... God, to God, if, if, if we think differently than, to you, God, then I pray, would you uh, change, God, show us in your word and change our mind. God, if there are people here this morning and they don't agree with what I'm saying, Father, I, I pray that, uh, 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 Lord, would you love on those people, God? Would you, uh, Father, would you show them, God, in your word, God, whether what I'm saying is right or wrong, Holy Spirit, would you reveal that to them? 
And God, I pray that we would be committed in this season in particular, while we are looking at things that are going on in the world, in this season in particular, we would be committed to taking logs out of our own eyes as well. Yes, we have them. God, I thank you that you dealt with sin. You died on the cross. Sin was such an abhorrent thing for humanity that you went to such great lengths to not only forgive us, but Father, to free us from the power of sin. And I pray, Lord, each of us in this room, those areas in our own life, God, where sin still has dominion, God, that we would, uh, uh, Father, you would help us to outwork that and to walk out that, God, that walk out that freedom that you purchased for us on the cross, Lord. And God, we thank you for your grace today. I thank you for the grace of Jesus. And Father, I want to pray also for our community, God, this Lismore community. God, we, uh, we have a name. They call us the Rainbow Region. And God, we know there are a lot of people out in our community that, that God would flat out disagree with what we believe and what we've talked about this morning. They would flat out disagree with our stance on sexual ethics and so on, Father. But God, I pray that you would teach us how do we love them passionately as Christ loved the, loved the world. You so loved the world that you gave up your son. I pray that you would help us straddle that tension, Father, of passionately loving the people in the world, but at the same time passionately upholding the truth of God. And we would not compromise on truth. I pray, Father, we would love people. We would love people. And that our love would open them up to the truth of God. That they would find themselves in Christ. And that, Lord, we would then allow and trust that the Holy Spirit, once we're in Christ, the Spirit goes to work, convicting and changing. Your word will do its work. So, Father, I thank you for each person in this room. God, I pray, I pray, I pray, Father, in the coming weeks, as uncomfortable as it may be, God, I pray that we would, I pray that we would be given the opportunity to have conversations with people that are battling some of these things we're talking about. God, we don't want to sit in a holy huddle and just talk, talk, talk about stuff. You've put us in this world, God. You've placed us in this world, in this time, in this season, in this place, for a divine purpose. If you've got to push us outside of our comfort zones, Father, I pray do it. Make us more like Jesus. Father, I ask this in your name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.